Okay, it's two o'clock. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So thanks everybody for uh, coming to hear about uh, what we're doing with uh, OpenStack on Solaris and generally uh, OpenStack at Oracle. Um, so I'm Dave Miner. I'm the uh, uh, architect in the Solaris organization for system management and deployment and, and cloud related things. Um, so I do, you know, if you're a Solaris user, um, You've certainly used things I've worked on, like SMF and uh, the automated installers, the boot environment software that's in Solaris 11, um, all these sorts of things. Uh, the last couple of years, I've spent most of my time working on OpenStack, uh, so it's become a big focus for us. And uh, in reality, my, in the OpenStack team, my role is not so much development, but to run our internal cloud. So uh, as the team calls me, I'm customer zero. I'm the guy who gets all of the first look at everything and all the worst bugs right away. So let's get the legal stuff. Um, so we'll start with, uh, yeah, just to give you some context about what's going on with OpenStack and, and at Oracle generally. Um, you know, it's a big focus for us. You know, we, we do infrastructure in all sorts of forms, you know, between Solaris and Linux, Oracle VM, um, you know, and then all layers above it. Uh, and we do the hardware underneath. So we, we've got you know, great opportunities to integrate in a lot of ways with our products around something like OpenStack, which has such a you know, vast reach in terms of the functionality and the, and the layers of software that, that, that are the effects. So you know, if, you, if you look at our, um, you know, look at a typical you know, OpenStack architecture, you know, we've got integration going on in, in compute uh, with Oracle Linux and Solaris and Oracle VM in terms of the hypervisors and management and, and the OSs that we run on and, and the guests that we can run. And in networking, we've got virtual networking products that are uh, you know, separate from Solaris that are usable with Linux. And we have uh, in Solaris its own uh, virtual, net, virtual networking functions. And storage, uh, well, you know, we, we all know about ZFS. It's uh, the best thing since <coughs> sliced bread, right? And uh, you know, we make take great advantage of that in uh, you know, building out our, our cloud functionality uh, around Solaris and you know, integrating that behind Cinder. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll be doing some interesting things with Swift as well as we go along. Um, you know, and, and Glance image deployment, uh, you know, we've got uh, functionality in, in Solaris uh, you know, providing images and, and you know, generally Oracle has VM templates uh, that we offer. You know, historically those have been for the Oracle VM pro you know, product. And as you see over time, you know, we start making those things available through, uh, you know, things like the uh, uh, Murano app catalog and, uh, you know, in, in containers and things like that. Um, you know, you'll start seeing those show up as, as artifacts that you can use with your clouds. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on at Oracle related to OpenStack making OpenStack a really you know, viable uh, thing to use with all of our products. In terms of Solaris, which is what, you know, so that was the general thing. We're going to talk about Solaris pretty much the rest of this time, so uh, that's, what, that's, that's what I do. Um, you know, really our, our strategy with Solaris and, you know, the strategy that Oracle's followed since acquiring Sun is, has all been all about, you know, building that entire integrated stack top to bottom, hardware all the way up to applications. And, you know, we see that in, in what we're doing around Solaris, where we're you know, co-engineering with the database teams, the Java teams, and, and, you know, working with other application teams, and, you know, also driving things down into the hardware uh, to support those functions. So, you know, it's really, you know, it, it's a, a highly integrated vertical strategy for horizontal scalable computing. Um, you know, our most recent Solaris release is 11.3, came out last fall. And, uh, you know, as part of Solaris 11.3, we, we include OpenStack, uh, Juno. And uh, we've started with uh, Havana back in uh, uh, Solaris 11.2. Um, you know, if, if you look at uh, uh, what we do uh, with, you know, Solaris generally, um, you know, a lot of what we're focused on is, you know, security, Compliance. Um, those are some features that you've seen show up in 11.3. Um, a lot of focus on simplicity. You know, we're really doing a lot of things to try to make an operating system simpler to run. I mean, Solaris is a big, complicated beast. Its you know roots go back 30 plus years, and 
we won't talk about how for long I've worked on it, but um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the reality is that uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex system. And what you know, me and my colleagues have really focused on for most of the last 10 years has been, OK, how do we make that simpler? How do we integrate it better? How do we make it you know, not just a, a bucket of parts that you're putting together, but truly a, a, a easy to use operating system that you can deploy uh, quickly and easily? So, you know, I alluded a little of this earlier, but, you know, when we look at OpenStack and how it integrates with, with Solaris, um, you know, Nova, right now we offer, uh, you can run guests on Solaris that are either regular Solaris zones that you've seen since Solaris 10, the original containers, and uh, more recently, kernel zones, which showed up with Solaris 11.2, which are more of a, a virtual, uh, pair of virtualized hypervisor, which allow you to run a separate kernel, from the global zone, when, you know the standard uh, native Solaris zones are a shared kernel. Um, and the networking, Elastic Virtual Switch, we have you know we, we have some uh, virtual networking technology that underlies our, our Neutron implementation. So if you're running OpenStack on Solaris, there's no Nova networking. You're using Neutron, which is more complex, definitely, but a lot more powerful. You've got a lot more capabilities there, and you know, we've we've got a uh, virtual switching technology that we use underneath that. Um, we talked about ZFS and, and Cinder and, and Swift there. And uh, Glance, the Unified Archives. Um, Unified Archives are a feature that we introduced in Solaris 11.2, which allow us to take an, an image of a deployed system, including the contained zones and kernel zones, and redeploy that um, in, in other contexts. You can do an exact replication of it. You can do cloning, where you just take one element of an archive and redeploy it elsewhere. Um, and, and in a different context, you can take bare metal, turn it into a virtual machine, or vice versa. So if you use Solaris 10 and flash archives and, and on the earlier releases, uh, this is way more powerful. Um, and it's you know, one of my brain children. Uh, it was a really hard project for us to do. Um, so what is Solaris? really provide in an OpenStack context, though, that's you know, kind of unique. I mean, there, there's, uh, if you look around at this entire community, it's everybody else is Linux. So we're the weird ones here. <laughs> Why would we do that? Um, you know, I think there, there, there's a few you know, really unique things that you get out of running OpenStack on Solaris. Um, you know, one, hey, we've gone and built and integrated it all. It's all packaged up. You, know, you, you look at a lot of the uh, deployments out there. Uh, you know, I see a lot of people running things upstream, you know, from upstream and having to figure out how to package it up themselves or, uh, you know, just using tarballs and stuff like that. You know, we've gone and, and done the packaging work necessary to make this really easy to deploy and also easy to upgrade. And that's really a big key when you talk about, uh, you know, you can get a cloud deployed, but you gotta, you're going to have to upgrade it eventually. And how easy is that going to be? Um, boot environments really a great thing when we talk about upgrades because not all your upgrades are going to go well. Sometimes you're going to have to back off for unanticipated reasons. And boot environments let you do that. You know, it's a pretty unique feature. We're just starting to see you know, some of that sort of thing show up in Linux. But you know, it's something we've had for uh, 15 years if you, if you go back and, and look at the roots of it. Um, one of the other neat, you know, recent features is immutable zones which allow us, I'll talk that more about in a, in a little bit, but this allows us to really lock down the underlying system, the, the deployments of, of OpenStack, and it's something you can also use in the guests that you deploy. And, we've got a lot, and we have a lot of fault resilience built into the system. I won't say fault tolerance because that's a completely different thing to talk about, but fault resilience. You know, we've had features in the OS like the, the service management facility since Solaris 10. And these give us you know, some very good capabilities for ensuring that the services that provide you know, your OpenStack, you know, OpenStack control plane uh, can stay up. They're reliable. We get diagnostics out of it. We, man we manage the faults. So um, when we talk about running the OpenStack services on Solaris, one of the big keys and one of, the, you know, one of the things that we've done that's fairly unique is figure out how to run those with minimal privileges. So you know, in the event that somebody manages to hack your API services or, your, or any of the other uh, 
uh, services that are that are running, you know, you know, the 30 or 40 or 50 services you might be running for your OpenStack control plane, that we've contained the fault, contained the, the boundary that they can affect there. You know, we don't run these services as root. We run them under uh, reduced privileges, different user accounts, and only give them the privileges that they need. We also, when we talk about security and OpenStack, you know, what about the data at rest? How do you ensure that's secure? ZFS is built-in encryption, very easy to use. It's available in all of our, uh, you know, both our, our ZFS storage appliances and Slayer CFS itself. And it's very easy to, for you to configure it under sender so that all of your block, all your block storage is encrypted. Um, we talk about data in motion security. And of course, you can use things like SSL and IPsec and things like that for your, uh, you know, securing your control plane in, in various ways. But there's also the issue of even if you even if you weren't doing that, uh, an extra layer to, to help you there, if you've got multiple tenants running over the same network here, is how do we ensure that we uh, keep the keep the data in motion when we're migrating VMs around between our uh, between our compute nodes? We have a secure migration capability built in for, for migrating zones so that all of, your, um, all of your migrations between the compute nodes are secured uh, on the link. And you can always run, as, as I mentioned earlier, applications with a um, immutable zone. So just a, a quick sidelight about uh, encryption here. Um, now, if you haven't had a chance to try out a, uh, our latest systems, the, the T7 and M7 systems and the M7 processor. You know, one of the things we like to point out is that we can encrypt everything essentially at no cost. We've got uh, all, of the, um, you know, all, all of the common encryption algorithms are baked right into the chip. So we can offload all of that work. You never see that as CPU impact on your compute nodes or any of the other things that, that happen to be running here in your OpenStack environment. Um, and we've got you know, other features of silicon secured memory, which is, uh, which is a new feature that we've just introduced, which allows us to lock down memory regions so that we can ensure that you know, some of the bugs that you've seen out there, some of the more recent you know, brand name exploits out there can't happen in these environments because we can, we can protect memory adjacent regions. And you know, just to say a little bit about the performance, uh, you know, these are pretty stunning differences in an M7 uh, system versus you know, either Intel or IBM uh, processors. You know, when we're talking, you know, 10 to 30 times difference in um, you know common algorithms, that's a very remarkable difference. One of the other things I mentioned earlier in Solaris 11.3 is a compliance feature. So we've gone, we've gone and built a new compliance command that you can run on each node to uh, you know, check your system's deployment against uh, you know, different uh, compliance profiles that you might have, such as PCI or some of the federal uh, uh, profiles that, that are out there. Um, so you can make your systems compliant out of the box. You can check them. And we'll be providing remediation features to automatically remediate problems there. One of the things that's not there in Solaris 11.3 is multi-node compliance, but that's something you're going to see coming in, in uh, future releases. And so we'll be able to monitor your entire cloud for compliance. So that's kind of the, you know, the general, here's this, you know, the features in Solaris that are really you know, key in, in uh, managing, uh, you know, in, in deploying and managing a uh, OpenStack cloud environment. So a couple of years ago, when we uh, got to the point where we had a, you know, a builds of Havana that sort of worked and such, you know, the next thing was, well, how do we know that they really work? We need to, we need to start using this stuff ourselves. And uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, um, opportunity, shall we say, to, to do that. Uh, if you looked at how we uh, have historically done engineering in Solaris, well, if you need to test machines, well, we have you know, a web page you go off and reserve systems, you know, reserve entire systems. And most of us squatted, on, we'd get one and we'd squat on it for you know, months, years at a time. Uh, very inefficient and, and uh, 
uh, you know, high-cost environment, <coughs> relatively speaking. You know, more recently, we you know started handing out you know kernel zones and LDOMs and things like that in this, but still, it was a very you know static uh, infrastructure in that sense. So there, you know, there wasn't a lot of choice in sizes of machines you could have, and um, you know, very little capability to build you know any any complex networking infrastructures that you might need and things like that. So we needed to modernize. And you know, like everybody else, well, hey, here's the cloud. Why aren't we doing that? So we've done that, and we've been running that, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but we've, you know, what we've got right now is a small cloud. It's not a huge cloud by any stretch of the imagination. But we're going to build a huge one. Um, you know, really build our build out to the scale that, you know, similar to what our customers will want to deploy for private clouds. And you know, generally, our you know ongoing strategy will be you know provide a good hybrid cloud environment where you know your your on-premises private cloud and the Oracle public cloud products will be able to interoperate and you'll be able to migrate workloads between them. So you know, generally, we need to build some big clouds that involve Solaris and such to you know make this all you know, all work out. Um, so that's what we're that's the stage we're in now. You know, we've done the. Uh, run the small cloud. Now we're trying. Now we're going to go big. Um, but sometimes I feel like Tom Cruise in this picture, <laughs> just latched onto the side of the airplane that's lumber lumbering along here, and then you know, it's going to be a hard problem to deal with. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about our cloud, to me, you know, compared to what most other people are doing, is that uh, generally you're running OpenStack. You may be running off of, um, you know, you may be running off upstream off the tip. But you're probably running on like an LTS version of the OS underneath, right? Um, me, on the other hand, I've got a OS that's changing every two weeks. That's our pro that's our build cycle in Solaris, and the goal here is, and OpenStack's integrated that. So the goal here is we upgrade every time, and we find all these problems well before they ever show up in any customers. So everything's a moving piece, all the time. <laughs> Makes it a very uh, challenging thing. Um, you know, and then the other part of all of this is, you know, getting, you know, an understanding of, of OpenStack and cloud computing and such and, you know, pulling that knowledge that we, that we gain in running this out and, and, you know, how do we make Solaris work better? How do we get, you know, the whole organization really aligned behind building, you know, great cloud computing platform? So here's the rudimentary diagram of this is the cloud we started out with. Um, a couple of years ago, yeah, six little nodes, a couple uh, yeah, reasonably good-sized compute nodes. Um, you know, this was OpenStack Havana, and uh, you know everything running on bare metal, and no HA. This was you know this was our sandbox to start with. Um, we did have uh, data link multipathing for uh, the network links. Partially, partially for you know giving us additional aggregate capacity, but also giving us a little bit of resilience for you know switch failures and, and things like that. And, but as you can see, it's a it's a very simple, very simple layout to start with, and, and uh, that's where we were. Uh, you know now we've gone and built out something that's you know well, four times bigger, roughly at this point in time, four to five times bigger, and. Uh, you know, what you see here is, you know, we, we've got a collection of systems that are, you know, providing the various pieces. And, um, you know, in terms of compute nodes, you know, I think one of the, again, interesting aspects of our cloud that you won't see anywhere else is it's a multi-architecture cloud. It's x86 and Spark. Um, now we're running a lot of this stuff right now on x86 is for historical reasons in terms of that's the machines I had in the, in, you know, available to, to build things initially and so forth. But you know, in terms of the compute nodes, we're, you know, we're, we're basically 50-50 in terms of capacity of, of Spark and x86. And oh, by the way, you know, we brought in ZFS storage appliance cluster now to provide our back end for Cinder and the other things that we want to do with storage. So it's gotten you know, a lot more capacity, a lot more performance. We've upgraded the networking along the way. Initially, it was all one gig networking. Now it's 10 gig. And uh, you know we're continuously uh, updating everything. So go on. What we're trying to get to is you know, a, real, a real global, multi-region, multi-cell architecture. Uh, because 
uh, Solaris Development is a highly distributed organization. We have you know, major engineering sites you know, across the US. Uh, there's one here in Austin, uh, uh, Colorado, California. I'm actually in Boston. Um, and uh, you know, overseas, we have a bunch of my colleagues in, in Dublin, Prague, Beijing, you know, various places like that. So, uh, and the big region, you know, big uh, big sites in, in France and, and the UK as well. So, yeah, we've got a globally distributed environment that we need to support and you know learn how to really run you know, massive scale clouds there. So, I apologize for this incredibly detailed diagram that my friend Octave drove drew for us. Um, but you know this really shows where we're trying to go, and you know you can compare it to that initial crude diagram that I drew two years ago. Um, you know this is you know what our clouds are going to look like, you know what our, our various regions are going to look like. Um, you know we're in the process of going from uh, uh, OpenStack Kilo, which is going to be showing up uh, in Solaris 11.3 real soon now in one of our uh, uh, support updates. Our next release after that, we're planning to be Mataka. We're going to skip Liberty because we've been on this treadmill of trying to catch up to the community, and really the only way we can get there is we got to hop all the way to Mataka and uh, get ourselves current there. So that's going to have some interesting challenges to it. Um, you see, you know, with, with uh, all of the network links here, we've got a, we've got a lot of redundancy built in. Um, we're going to have uh, uh, HA load balancing. So in Solaris, we actually have an integrated load balancer that, um, frankly, we haven't used very much, so we're having to find all sorts of interesting uh, things with it. But um, it's actually working out better than, uh, than, better than most of the things that we don't use work, so <laughs> that part's good. Um, but yeah, you're, you know, we're, we're, yeah, essentially, we're building an architecture which is all horizontally scaled with uh, load balancers and, and, and so forth. Um, you know, the, the public and private uh, API and, and you know, back-end nodes, these will all be things that we run in, in various containered uh, architectures, and I'll talk more about that in, in, a, in a second. But, uh, you know, essentially, it's all going to be a very horizon horizontally scaled uh, environment. Uh, one of the other things that, you know, is, is interesting here is you know, we're, we'll be going to Neutron DVR as our networking architecture. So uh, full, uh, right now we're, you know, we're kind of a centralized L3 agent architecture with all of the, you know, opportunities for failure that that represents. And so going to a full DVR architecture will give us a, a much better uh, fault management story. And one of the other key little points here is that we will uh, have both Linux and Solaris compute nodes in this architecture. Um, right now we don't have any Linux compute nodes in our cloud um, because the, if you recall, we talked about the uh, the, the um, virtual networking that we're using under, under Neutron is a Solaris Elastic Virtual Switch. We're in the process of bringing in the OVS, OpenV, OpenV Switch, as our underlying uh, network virtualization technology. So at that point, we'll be able to have full interoperability between Solaris and Linux at the virtual networking layer, use the ML2 plugins the same way. So we can have the cloud that everybody really wants, which is the you know, mixed, mixed OS cloud. Because none of our customers, and neither do we, want to deploy, well, here's a Linux cloud, here's a Solaris cloud, and, well, maybe we can tie them together you know, at some level through Keystone and stuff like that. But uh, ultimately, that's not very satisfying. So just to you know, talk a little bit about uh, you know, what our, um, you know, how we run our cloud. Um, you know, I've got you know hundreds of Solaris engineers that are my customers. Um, they tend to be rather uh, piggish about what they think they need in terms of resources. Um, you know, tell them, well, yeah, two gig VM. They're going, what? Two gig VM? I want more than that. <laughs> um, so you know, we did. You know, over time, we've we've spent some time learning how. Uh, you know, what was the, really the sweet spot in terms of the things they needed for resources and. So, you know, basically our, you know, our tenant model is, you know, each of our users is, is a tenant. We also have some shared tenants, you know, for projects and, and for other production uses that we're, that we're starting to run on the cloud. Um, but, you know, essentially we've got some quotas and, you know, there's, there's you know, right now we're a little limited on some resources, so they're probably a little lower than you might think, but that's okay. It's, uh, it's still something for everybody to, to work with. Um, and you know, like everybody else, the, the onboarding of 
uh, users into this is an interesting question. Um, you know, we've got a uh, you know very simple self-service you know, create user Python script that you know, they go and run and, and gets them an account and, and uh, project and you know sets up sets up the basic things there. Uh, we need to build a buoy for that in some of my really scarce free time. We look at how we deploy our infrastructure. Um, right now, we mostly are running our the, the, the various OpenStack infrastructure elements, you know, on the global zone and bare metal. Um, that's really not that efficient. You know, I look at the, the utilization that we're getting, the utilization levels we have there. It's it's you know not a, you know, not really the way you should run this at all. And especially as we move forward and move a lot of this stuff onto uh, T7, M7 based systems. Um, they're way overpowered for doing that. So, um, you know, as we're moving out new generations of the services, we're, you know, we're moving them towards kernel zones and non-global zones. And, you know, there, there's various reasons to choose each of those. Um, right now, uh, with, you know, obviously Nova Compute, you've got to run on bare metal, that's fine. Um, you know, you can't run that in a container, I suppose, and, and make things more complicated, but frankly, it doesn't really, it doesn't really benefit from doing that. Uh, Neutron L3 agents, the other thing that we have to run um, in the global zone at this point in time, but that's uh, something that will, um, over time, won't be necessary any, any longer. So most of the time, what, what we're going to do is deploy those, uh, deploy the services in kernel zones, at least in the near future. Um, so that gives me, you know, the ability to migrate those around uh, between you know, my, my uh, various, you know, the hardware that I'm using underneath. Um, and also allows me to be you know, kernel independent in terms of what I'm running in the hypervisor versus what we're running the services under. Now, global zones, they're, they're a good choice for this um, as well. And there's actually some reasons why we would use them. Because uh, if, we're, if, we're if we've got services that we need to run active passive and use Solaris cluster with, this is actually our, our best option is to run uh, that, uh, those in non-global zones and use uh, zone, the zones clustering technology that's in Solaris cluster. So the other thing that we'll be looking at is Docker containers. And if uh, you've been paying attention to some of the things we've been talking about with Solaris, uh, Docker is something we've been working on for a while. Um, if you've followed the Docker community closely, you've seen some pull requests in the last few months for uh, really the last month for things to start showing up upstream. And uh, you know, in a near future, we'll have uh, Docker as an option uh, for you to run on Solaris. And, you know, I've been to a couple talks already at this conference, you know, at this summit and uh, uh, around, you know, people running their infrastructures in Linux containers and using you know, Kubernetes and stuff like that for orchestration. Those are going to be options here as well. And we'll talk, we I mentioned the immutability <laughs> features earlier, and we can just dive into that a little bit right now. Um, so the immutable zones feature in Solaris, what's really cool about it is, you know, it's not just a matter of, oh, we just make all the file systems read only and then you can't do anything. Um, that's not useful. As I, <laughs> when we first started talking about this feature, I, you know, I said to them, I said, well, I can't run my, I can't run my infrastructure with that sort of environment because you know, we need to make changes to you know, the OpenStack configuration files and occasionally some of the other things in the system um, without having to reboot those systems. So if you look at how, um, we do uh, the, the um, immutable zones feature. There's actually what we call a trusted path into the system that allows for various pieces of the system to be writable while maintaining a largely read-only profile. And we have several different profiles that you can apply to the system, depending on you know what parts of you know which which risks you're, you are most concerned about. Um, so you know, generally we we're, we're working on applying a, a profile that's you know leaving you know some of the configuration files writable, so that we can uh, we can do this stuff. What we'll be doing more long term here is uh, we'll make it such that Puppet and you know other configuration manage to management tools, but Puppet's the one we bundle with Solaris. The Puppet will actually be able to run in the in the trusted domain and make changes itself while keeping the other paths. Uh, Locked down, so you know you can ensure that, yeah, my infrastructure it's managed through Puppet. It's not, you know, I don't have somebody SSHing into one of my, you know, one of my pieces of infrastructure and making changes um, that Puppet then has to go reverse. We can, you know, really ensure that that you know we don't have those SKUs for any length of time. 
Uh, talking about the hardware specs of, you know, what, you know, what do we do in our cloud? You know, what kind of hardware are we running? Uh, you know, right now it's, you know, uh, it, it's an assortment of stuff. It, you know, there were some various things that I had available a couple of years ago that, you know, we deployed and then we, you know, we started buying additional things uh, as we go along. Um, you know, right now each of our compute nodes, you know, we're running anywhere from 10 to 60 instances per compute node, you know, based on the sizes that people choose. That, you know, the flavors that we offer, you know, range from, Two gigs of memory up to 32 gigs of memory, you know, various sizes of, uh, of block storage to go along with that. Um, so, you know, we, we get a range of, of usages. But you know, right now, we've basically you know, come to the conclusion that the right level for us to, to standardize on is, you know, half terabyte of memory per compute node, two processor configurations. Because, you know, especially on Spark, you know, the number of, of threads we've got off of those is you know, pretty massive. And it actually, you know, turns out that if I look at the utilization on my compute nodes, is, um, you know, it's actually not that high. <laughs> it's actually really hard to keep all those processors busy um, at this level. But, uh, you know, so if we went with say one terabyte of memory per compute node, we'd have a better balance there. But then I got the problem of, okay, we need to do maintenance on one of these things. How long is it going to take me to evacuate that thing? You know, <laughs> and it's you know the classic fire escape problem of you know how do you get everybody out of the building or off the plane? So, seems like half terabytes about the right sweet spot at this point in time. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know we're using storage appliance clusters to backend Cinder. Um, you know, what's interesting in my observations of this, uh, you know, iSCSI was not something we had done a lot with internally. You know, we've had it as part of Solaris for many years, but internally it wasn't something we used very much. You know, we all had local disks and, or we used NFS. Um, so iSCSI to me was a, an unknown going in and it was, you know, to me it was probably the riskiest part of it. I'm going, we have no idea how well this is going to work. Um, turns out actually it's worked very well, um, surprisingly enough, because the amount of, we had used it. Um, but what is interesting to, see, to you know, see, you know, in our environment is that the, uh, you know, the, the workload that we see on, on the on, on the storage appliances, you know, 80% writes. The ZFS caching in the in the, uh, you know, in the guests is so good that there's, you know, once they're up, there's almost no read activity, um, you know, in terms of you know basic operations. You know, now if you're running a job like, you know, let's say a build a um, you know, build a Solaris source tree, well, yeah, there's a lot of read traffic there, there's, but there's still probably even more write traffic. So, um, you know, really it ends up being a, a uh, it's just an interesting data point on the workloads that we see. And it does affect how we configure the storage appliances. You know, we, we really go for, you know, logzillas and stuff like that and don't worry about the readzillas so much. Um, a little bit about our operational environment. Um, you know, this is how we, this is how we deploy our systems using you know, the standard Solaris features, automated installer, IPS as a, you know, for installing systems, unified archives for recovery and cloning. Uh, this allows me to, you know, essentially I can, you know, if we, my, my goal originally is we don't have any HA, but to need to be able to rebuild any of these nodes within 15 minutes, uh, you know, including booting the thing over the network. So uh, we were able to do that and, um, and that's, you know, that's worked out very well. Um, Papa as mentioned earlier, you know, we integrated that in uh, Solaris 11.2, and uh, we continue to extend it, uh, its capabilities in terms of Solaris, and you start, you know, starting to see some of our work there go back upstream into the Puppet community. Um, we use the Solaris RBAC for managing administrative access, so uh, you know, roots a roll, and we use it as little as possible. Um, and uh, you know we're pretty militant about filing bugs about anything where I have to go use root uh, because this is you know something where you know if we're going to provide the the level of security and auditability that you require in these environments, um, you know our back is is very key. And we also use that for doing you know some temporary administrative access for you know when I've got developers that I need to go look at some of my nodes. You know we have some abilities where we you know can put that in temporarily and then use. Uh, some SMF periodic jobs and IPS to revert that, that out when it's needed. Um, just wanted to show you an example of you know, what we do with Puppet, you know, some of the things we can do with Puppet. Just shows some of the extensions that we've done to Puppet for Solaris. So that you see, uh, we've got uh, you know, a class here for doing uh, essentially an aggregation uh, for Neutron. And you can see us setting up Solaris VLAN objects, IP interfaces, IP address objects, setting up the link aggregation, 
and you know, customizing some properties there how we're, in terms of how DLMP is going to detect failures. So you know, these are all you know, kind of slur specific extensions to what Puppet does and, and, and so forth, but you know, this, is, this is the kind of thing we're doing. Um, yeah, I mentioned SMF earlier. You know, this is, you know, a lot of our availability story is SMF detects when my services fail and crash, it can restart them. Um, so you know, we've got, uh, and we've got you know, good dependency checking, you know, stuff, in, and I mentioned the services, service privileges earlier. Um, just show you uh, something that you'll see coming in future release that I'm running now is uh, uh, zones as SMF instances. So what you see here is the zone is actually a fault notification that one of my guests on the cloud has failed. And I get that, you know, I get email on that. Actually, I get more of these emails than I would like because um, we've got some bugs around that. But, um, you know, essentially, you know, if, if you've got some, uh, you know, workloads that you need run more as pets rather than cattle on your cloud, we've, you know, we're going to have capabilities here for you to get the monitoring that you need about what's going on with them uh, as part of the operating system. So kind of wrapping up here, you know, we've been doing this two years, you know, how's this worked out for us? Um, you know, generally it's gone well. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier, we'd like to upgrade every two weeks. Well, that turns out not to be possible when your operating system has bugs during development. So we end up with, uh, you know, we've done 13 upgrades in two years, which is still an awful lot of upgrades. And, you know, that's across, you know, gone to Havana, to Juno, to Juno, to Kilo, most recently. We have had two upgrades that failed. In fact, you know, one last week, uh, which after we rebooted everything in, well, we found the, uh, we're, we're getting panics on uh, our, our uh, firewall software. So we had to back off, but it's boot environments. All I had to do was activate the old ones, reboot, we're back to where we were. So, you know, I can do these upgrades aggressively and not uh, be too concerned about what might happen. Yeah, we've got a couple hundred users and, as I said, you know, per user projects and such, so we've got you know, a few more tenants than that. And our availability actually has been pretty good considering I have no clustering, I don't have HA, there, there's no HA builder yet. We're going to be building that HA as, as we go along. Um, but, you know, we're, we're doing pretty well. Out of, you know, out of the downtime, it's probably been about 60% upgrades and 40% unplanned outages. Uh, and we've had two kind of big ones that were kind of annoying, but that's what happens. And a lot of bugs we filed. Um, I think everybody you know, really enjoys getting a bug tag with my little tag for, the, for those bugs because they get a lot of scrutiny of, well, this is something we need to fix before release. So I'll just close with you know, a couple things about what we're going to be doing uh, with Solaris and OpenStack in future releases. I mentioned Open vSwitch, so we'll be able to do Linux and Solaris uh, compute nodes. We're also going to have a, an OpenStack installer to really make it easy for you to deploy multiple clouds on um, you know, a catalog of systems. And that's something that uh, we've got largely completed. MySQL cluster, so when we talk about you know, the database backend that's you know, in, every, in every OpenStack installation, you know, how do you do your HA on your database? You know, classically, people are using you know, single you know, MySQL server and then you know, using uh, you know, the various you know, Linux clustering things around that. We've uh, got a set of patches for, to use MySQL cluster, so you can use an active-active configuration. That's something we're going to be contributing back up to the community as soon as we possibly can, as soon as we finish shaking out the bugs for that. I mentioned the multi-mode compliance, and um, we've got a lot of stuff around analytics. If you've used the ZFS storage appliance analytics, things like that are going to be showing up in Solaris, and they're going to be applied to this cloud management capabilities as well. And last thing I mentioned, uh, something I actually worked on myself, was bringing in uh, cloud-based init. So we have cloud init-like capabilities for uh, running your guests on Solaris. So that's what I have. Um, got a couple slides here just with, you know, if you want to follow my continuing adventures in doing this and uh, uh, some you know, basic background in getting started on uh, OpenStack for Solaris. Um, you know, we've got a mailing list there that you can get access to us and ask questions and things like that. So I've got like one minute for questions. Okay, I snowed you all. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Can you can you get to the microphone?
uh, when you mentioned the MySQL cluster yes. in progress, so did you mean Galera or it's your in OpenStack Euro? Galera is already there. He's going to take care of your. Yeah, this will be the, you still be using the, the the actual MySQL cluster upstream. So why not Galera? <coughs> so is there any? This seems simpler, and it and it doesn't require extra because, components. Uh, my question is that because Galera is becoming uh, more strong with the community, and it's more people are contributing. Uh, yeah, you know, I think more options for everyone's a good thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any others? One last question, and then I'm going to kick me off here. I was wondering if you could give a little more detail about your HA solution. What types of failures do, do you monitor and detect and correct? Yeah. So right now, uh, you know, what are we what are we doing about HA? Uh, I don't have a lot of monitoring going on yet. Um, the uh, there's a lot of things we can do with SMF right now. We you know we get the we get failure notifications on services, things like that. Um, you know, we can run some you know we run some canary jobs to you know make sure that things are sort of up. Um, nothing super sophisticated in that respect yet. Uh, we've got capabilities with SMF to run what we call what SMF calls monitor services, where we can you know much more uh, and have SMF do much more active monitoring of what's going on with those services. That's something you're going to see us uh, add a lot of capabilities around. So right now. It's not quite where we'd like it to be, but um, you know that's that's an area where we're doing a lot of work. Okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs>